and were given a tablet. Because if you look at the results of any trial, it works in some, you get no effect in others, and it makes some worse. And can you predict which category you're going to be in? So a physician presented with a patient, which category is the patient going to be in? They don't know. They have no way of knowing. So they give the pill, and then they ask, did you get better? Oh, no, I'm sorry, you've gotten worse. Well, it's not the pill, or it is the pill. You know, we don't know. All this is anecdotal, but it's the practice of medicine because we don't have the data to predict what any given patient will do on any given treatment with a pharmaceutical. Fortunately, we do with oxygen. We've got a reasonable degree of certainty that if your oxygen supply is reduced, you'll lose consciousness. And if that continues, you'll eventually die. So I'm suggesting to you that anecdotal information can be applied to groups if you're pretty certain about the data. But in, in relation to this slide, this, this, in fact, encompasses so many of the points that I want to make. Identical twi twins born to friends of mine at 29 weeks by emergency Caesar. So the point Dr. Lacey made about premature labor is very relevant here. Caesarean section, of course, so we don't have some of the variables that we've already spoken about, which are those variables involved in, in normal birth. Also, the mother can get a, a lot more oxygen because being anesthetized, the oxygen levels are generally increased. So children are delivered by emergency Caesar, identical twins, and one child actually is okay and one isn't. How do we know that? Well, day three, following the emergency seizure, both, child, both children were scanned using ultrasound. And it was found that one child had some periventricular damage on ultrasound. Rescanned on day 15, and unfortunately, both sides are affected. And the parents are taken to one side by the neurologist and told we're sorry, but this child will be severely mentally subnormal, blind, deaf, and will develop a spastic tetraplegia. It's difficult to imagine the horror of that situation. I've had to face a serious problem in one of my children that I diagnosed myself at the side of a cot, and that was an awesome experience. But I can't imagine that given the stresses that this couple had been through, being told that on day 15. But what I now know is that it's not always true, that the levels of ultrasound change in the infant, this infant, are compatible with normal development in perhaps a tiny percentage of cases. But you never, ever destroy the hope that that can happen. As they were friends of mine, of course, um, they called me about it. And what can you say if, if it's so certain? I didn't know the background. I didn't know the information that I've just told you. But I said, I'll look into it. So the, the birth took place on the 23rd of December, 1987. And at the end of February, the two children had progressed through the special care baby unit to uh, a normal ward and were doing well. And I remember phoning the mother and asking how they were doing. And fine, they're doing fine. Well, then the next question is, are they really doing fine? I mean, I know one twin's normal, but what about the other twin? Oh, yes, yeah, she's, she's doing very well. This is such a difficult area. You know, what do you then say? I, is the child normal? Well, in fact, it was volunteered. She, she's moving her arms and legs. And, and uh, so the next question then is, well, what do the pediatricians say? Will she actually develop normally? No. No, she won't. By, the, by somewhere around 18 months, she will in fact have become completely spastic and will be blind and deaf. And so the prognosis hasn't changed. Well, that's an astonishing situation. To have a child that is moving, we're now at around the time, beyond the time, when she would normally have been born at full gestation, and she has full arm and leg movement. And yet, 
we're told that all of that's going to go and be replaced by spasticity. So what's going on? Well, simply because I've been already interested in midbrain damage and interested in the way that divers get midbrain damage and MS patients get midbrain damage and stroke patients get midbrain damage and some cases of traumatic brain injury get midbrain damage, I knew what the blood supply was. And it's different in these areas of the brain, the periventricular areas, to the rest of the brain, remarkably different. And that's where the problem lies. So the following morning, archives diseases of children, I found the relevant data. This, in fact, NMR scans of the survivors of triplets with a normal infant on this side and an affected triplet on this side. What's happened? As a result of the damage in the midbrain sustained at birth, the ventricles have enlarged, but also another process has been stopped in its development. Starting a few weeks before normal term, a fatty covering to the nerve sheath develops, which covers them, protects them, and that process goes on for about two years after normal term delivery. But that process has been stopped in this affected twin. The myelin, which coats the fibers, has not formed. The cells which start in the spinal cord and myelinate going further and further towards the newly developed parts of the brain in the frontal lobes, that progression of myelination is by a cell called an oligodendrocyte. And these cells move through the nervous system covering nerve fibers. And they're formed from stem cells. And that migration of myelination eventually takes place right up to cortical level because cortical fibers are also myelinated, but not heavily myelinated. So the migration of stem cells through the nervous system completes this process of normal development. But it's been inhibited in this infant by the adverse circumstances in the midbrain. And as a consequence of that, the fibers remain exposed, the chemical environment is adverse, and the fibers which traverse this area of the brain eventually will degenerate. So unfortunately, this is not a static situation at all. It's a situation which deteriorates. This is the pathology. This is from an infant that died as a result of this problem, 30 weeks gestation. And this is the ventricle, and this is the area of damage. And if I had time, I would show you how this area is damaged, as I've said, in patients with MS, in divers, in patients with stroke, as a result of injury to the blood supply in this area. Well, in terms of pathogenesis, there are things that link cerebral pal palsy, as I've already said, with, with damage in this area from traumatic brain injury, multiple sclerosis, and stroke. And there are common factors, even in carbon monoxide poisoning. 